I need to take Betsy everywhere I go, I guess. So, um, <laughs> thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm here to talk with you tonight, uh, not necessarily about the boat school, but what kind of the reason I do work at the boat school now and, and our situation that occurred. And uh, I'm just going to give you right up front, um, sometimes I make it through this and without crying and other times I don't. <laughs> so it is an, a, an emotional thing for us. And uh, because, you know, we lost a son. And um, so when this all occurred, you know, everybody deals with grief and uh, trauma different ways, right? <clears throat> and how I had to deal with it is I had to understand what happened, how it happened, what could be done to prevent it, why hadn't that been done previously? All of these things, okay? And I had to dive deep. And so, a couple of years of uh, pretty dark times, and, um, but I came out the other side with a good understanding of what's going on. Of course, that education has just continued for the last 22 years since this occurred to us. And, uh, you know, diving into this as deep as I have, I've uh, been called on to do many, uh, unfortunately, investigations for other families and folks. I worked as a Tiger team for the Coast Guard on these issues for onboard and in-water electrocutions a bunch. So it's something that uh, I'm very passionate about and that is why I do what I do. So, let's get started here. <clears throat> it was a very hot summer day in Portland, Oregon area. Okay, I'm actually on the Multnomah Channel, if any of you know where that is. Uh, Sabi Island is out there, the Willamette comes down, it splits off and it forms an island there called Sabi Island. The Columbia River on the other side and what we call the Multnomah Channel goes down there. And this is where we had our sailboat. And we were in a place that we had decided we were gonna go cruising. And I had the fortunate opportunity uh, when I was young to live outside of the United States and get an, an incredible education from doing that. So I wanted to share that, that same dream, that idea with my children and uh, so we were on what we call the five-year plan I don't know if any of you've ever been on the five-year plan but you know those five-year plans have a way of extending and so anyway this is why we were, we were living aboard the boat we were trying to save uh, money and get the boat prepared and so we were living aboard um, it was uh, a fantastic community community like we've never had in this country before. It was just an amazing place at the time because everybody there was on the same mission, trying to get their boats ready to go and to go cruising. And so anyway, <clears throat> on this particular hot uh, day, I mean, it was in the 90s, and um, it, we were just doing stuff on the boat. I was getting ready. I think I was rebuilding the head. Any of you ever rebuild a head? <laughs> not, not the funnest job in the world, yes. But you know, anyway, it's one of those jobs and there was a knock on the side of the boat. And it was Spencer and Shelby. And Spencer and Shelby were the same age as our two boys, Ian and Lucas. And uh, they were just ecstatic. They were so happy and so excited because they got their very first boat. Now granted, it was an inner tube, okay? <laughs> it was a big truck inner tube, but, but they got their very first boat and they wanted to go on the maiden voyage and they wanted our, our kids to go with them. And so we were like, well, okay. So obviously, you know, and it was a rule that you didn't go to the cockpit without a life jacket on. Here, you put your life jacket on like you put your shirt on. That's the way it is. That was never a question. And of course, beyond that, um, because we're talking about four boys, 
you know, between the ages of eight and 10, might be a good idea for mom to kind of be walking along on the dock here, monitoring what's going on. And, and so um, basically, um, this life jacket, and I'm gonna point this out real quick. Do you guys recognize this type of life jacket? What does it do for us? Flotation. Face up. Face up flotation. Yeah. Right. So if you are find yourself in the water, conscious or not, it is going to turn you over because it's got a tremendous amount of flotation in the front. It's got a great big flat back here and a hook. Right? And they work really great. And it worked perfectly that particular day. Okay? So uh Basically, off they went, and uh, and Cheryl was going along, and, and I would because I was working on the head. I'm pretty sure um, that uh, they went walking along, and I stayed on to work on this job. Now, this particular marina um, on the Multnomah Channel here, there's one ramp coming down, and uh, the current typically runs this direction unless there is we're in flood state or something like that. And during the summer, a very common practice um, is because there, you can't, there's only one way in and one way out of here, and it wasn't super active in terms of boats going. Adults and children of the light during the summer would get on a flotation device and put it in right here and let it, the current carry them down the river, get to the bottom, get out, and do it all over again. <laughs> Make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that was something that happened all the time. Yeah. And, and so this is their maiden voyage, right, that they wanted to do. And so very, very excited. And Cheryl and I, you know, we looked at each other. We were both part of this decision process, which I find very important after the fact, right? And so both of us, you know, said, okay, we're going to allow this. You need to stay. I told them, you need to stay by the beach. If you hear a boat start, I want you to, you know, go and beach yourselves. And, you know, I was really... I never thought about electricity. It was not in my consciousness at all at that stage of the game. I was concerned, what if they dove underneath one of these docks, right, and got hung up on their life jacket? What if a boat backed out? You know, what about bacteria? What about, you know, all these other things that you could think about, but never electricity? And I've been a boater, you know, since I was young. Never heard of electricity being an issue. <clears throat> So uh, off they went, and uh, Cheryl had our youngest, Kyra, I think she was about four at the time, maybe, maybe a little younger than that, um, and uh, they went off to do uh, the maiden voyage, and Cheryl was going to walk along the dock and just keep an eye on, because, you know, two boys can get into, three boys can get in a little bit more, four boys, wow, you better, yeah, better <laughs> stick around. So uh, off they went. And um, I was working on the boat, and I heard a commotion. And uh, so I stuck my head out of the companionway, and somebody immediately yelled at me, where's Cheryl? Somebody's hurt. Okay, so I said, she's with the kids. Cheryl is a nurse. And, um, and so at the marina, anybody that was sick or maybe got hurt, they were the, you know, Cheryl's the first professional medical help, right? And so um, <clears throat> I said, well, Cheryl's with the kids up there. And I saw a, a, a bunch of people gathering. And so I ran down to see what was going on. And as I approached, uh, I recognized that there was two people on, on one of these fingers in this area. Our boat was down here, bending over and pulling someone out of the water. And I, as I got closer, of course, I recognized that it was our son, Lucas. And uh, I pushed through the crowd, and they had laid Lucas down um, on the dock there. And I'm going, okay, what, what is going on here? And um, I do what I'm going to call a quick triage because I don't understand exactly why. You know, apparently he's unconscious. Right, because he's not moving. Um, so I look, is he injured? There's no, you know, he's not bleeding. I don't see any injury. And so uh, what do you do as a parent right now? So I immediately got down 
to check to see if he was breathing, right? And Lucas was not breathing. That was very, very obvious. So then I went to check and see if I could detect a heart, right? a heartbeat at all. And I didn't. And I'm hoping at the time that I'm doing this wrong, right? So I start CPR. And I'm, I'm doing CPR by myself for the first, um, you know, I don't know how long for sure. I guess the witnesses told us that it was about 20 minutes before EMS finally arrived. And uh, sometime in there, one of the neighbors jumped in with me. But the whole time I'm doing <clears throat> CPR, Lucas's color is absolutely perfect. Now, have any of you seen a drowning victim before? It's not, um, unfortunately, it, it's not a pretty sight. And their color is anything but perfect, right? So as I am there doing CPR, looking at Lucas's color, it's giving me a tremendous amount of hope. Does that make sense? Because, yeah, there's no way that he drowned at this stage again because his color's so good. And I must be doing CPR right because his color is still so good. EMS finally arrives. Um, and of course, uh, he had his life jacket still on. Now I had opened up his life jacket so that I could do better chest compressions. But when they arrived, they of course, well, a young boy, water, what is their assumption? Yeah. Drowning, right? And so anyway, eventually uh, we were able to get them to get the ADD on Lucas and it, uh, they hooked it all up and uh, we moved them to the center of the dock where there was more room real quickly while continuing doing CPR and they turned the machine on and it analyzed. It fired once, twice, three times and stopped. We transported Lucas to uh, Legacy Emanuel Hospital, where Cheryl worked as an RN. And um, doctors did everything that they could, and they came out about half an hour after we got there and said, we're very sorry. Nothing we could do. What happened? And, I, and we asked them, what happened to Lucas? They had all of his medical records there. We'd been in that system for a long time. Lucas was a perfectly healthy eight-year-old boy. What happened? And they just shook their heads and said, we don't know. Um, this is not consistent with drowning. Hopefully, the autopsy will tell us something. So we went home. Um, worst night of our lives. Didn't really sleep. And all night long, I'm just trying to figure out what possibly could have happened. The next morning, um, we got, you know, I was thinking about it all night long, and, and there was uh, at least half a dozen people on the back of their boats that were there watching and observed this whole thing. Cheryl, of course, um, and I didn't realize that at the time had jumped into the water. And uh, when she hit the water, you know, downstream of where uh, this occurred, so she jumped in the water about right here she described it as when she hit the water, it was like jumping into a vat of wet cement. Can you imagine 
jumping into a vat of wet cement. Could you move? I mean, it, she couldn't move. Her extremities were barely moving. And she was able to grab a hold of Lucas's life jacket as she jumped in. And fortunately, had enough location to keep them both up. And she was able to get uh, Lucas over um, right in this area. And this is about the time that I came up. And uh, those two people grabbed Lucas and pulled him out of the water right there. So I got all of these people together and I said, please tell me your stories. Now, I should say that the night before, I got a call from law enforcement saying, we're very sorry that your son died from drowning. And I said, I'm not convinced that he drowned. Yes, your son drowned. OK? Uh, and I said, well, I, I, you know, I would like to talk to the coroner about this and stuff. And, and long and short, um, got off with him. And that next morning, as everybody that is there that is witnessing this, there was a little bit of differences describing that was going on. And, and this is what they came up with and, and what they told me. That, you know, Cheryl is over here on the dock with our daughter Kyra and just walking along watching the boys as they're doing their thing. They're having a good time, they're splashing, they're yelling, they're fighting, they're doing all the things that four boys, eight to ten, would be doing on an inner tube in the water for their first time, right, with this boat. And they're out here, and Lucas decided for whatever reason that he wanted to get out of the water. And so he started heading over this direction. And he got about four feet from this wooden ladder. Now these docks are wooden, okay? And uh, he got about four feet from that. He let out a yell and then a big gasp, very audible gasp, and rolled onto his back. Cheryl, recognizing that something horrific has happened here, yells at the other boys, uh, our son Ian, and Lucas, uh, Ian and Spencer and Shelby help Lucas. So they start swimming towards Lucas. And my son Ian describes this as, as they were approaching, and actually the other two boys as well, as they were approaching Lucas, all of a sudden they realized that there was this pulsation that they started feeling, a pulsation in the water, very rapid pulsation 60 hertz pulsation yeah and that pulsation is a move closer change to tingling of their skin okay and at that point thank god they backed off okay thank god they backed off Lucas is here and he's floating and he's bumping up, he bumped up against the boat and he's continuing heading this direction. Cheryl comes running down here, she's dropped Kyra off with someone else and she jumps in right there, grabbing Lucas's life jacket as she hits the water. And fortunately having enough flotation to keep them both up. Because she didn't think she was gonna be able to swim. Just couldn't move. <coughs> At no time, according to all the witnesses, was Lucas's face in the water. Okay? Never was his face in the water. And, uh, you know, so what happened? Cheryl then starts describing to me that morning, too, or maybe it was that evening, that when she hit the water that she couldn't move. Ian and Spencer and Shelby are all saying we felt this pulsation and as they approached that pulsation changed from that or continued but then there was tingling on their skin and I got an idea is it possible that there's electricity in the water is that a possibility because this is just not quite adding up clearly in my mind and according to all the witnesses he didn't drown because his face was never in the water. How, how do you drown if your face is never in the water? Okay, now, 
they have told law enforcement that as they approached Lucas, it was as if he, as if he had turned into an electric eel. And what do you think law enforcement did with that? Kids, right? Electric eel. But that was, that compiled with Cheryl's experience and the tingling and the pulsation, you know, and I, I knew more at that moment than the average voter probably about marine electrical, but you know, um, certainly not as much as, I mean, yeah. Anyway, that was a long time ago. So I go down, uh, I grab a digital voltmeter, not unlike the one I've got here, and I go down to the area where this all occurred, and I took my voltmeter, and I dropped one of the leads into the water right there, and the other one I grounded on, I'm gonna call it a pedestal, okay? <clears throat> now, I didn't know for sure at that, I mean, I didn't know enough to know that I really should have made sure that there was a grounding conductor connected on that, I know we got at least one double E in here tonight, and electrical engineer, I should say. And, uh, you know, so, but I didn't test that, and of course I certainly would have tested that today. But fortunately, there was a grounding conductor on there, appropriately. And I put my meter on um, volts DC first, and it was just kind of bouncing around randomly, nothing very, very low. And then I switched it to AC and it very instantly went to seven volts AC, very solid number. And I go, whoa, there shouldn't be seven volts AC here. By the way, have any of you, you know, seven volts, I mean, that doesn't sound like a lot, right? Have any of you, and I don't know why we do this, but have any of you taken yes. a battery, yeah. a nine volt battery, and stick it on your tongue? And again, I don't know why we do this, but we all do for some reason, you know, myself included, <laughs> yeah. right? Anybody not do that ever? Okay, well, we got some smart people in the room. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not adventurous, I don't know. Anyway, so what do you think? Seven volts, that's not a, that's not a big number, uh, but what is the difference between that battery and this seven volts? Current. What's that? Voltage. Voltage. Amperage. Voltage. Amperage. I'm amperage. How about the battery's DC direct current, and this is AC. That's the difference, and that is a huge difference. Seven volts AC is uh, well. It shouldn't be there, right? Should there be? Let me ask you this question. Let's make this real clear. Should there be any AC in our water? Is any amount okay? Okay, seven volts again doesn't sound like a lot. But I went back to the boat, told Cheryl what I found, picked up the phone, called the investigator, the detective, uh, and I said, look, you know, I know you already told me that my son drowned. I disagree with that. And by the way, I just found seven volts AC in the water. And he goes, so? Okay, uh, there's seven volts AC in the water and it shouldn't be there. Well, how do you know? And you know, it just went, didn't go well. Okay, so I finally said to, you know, and no disrespect, because he didn't know anything about this. So I said, look, I'm asking for your permission. I'm dad, I shouldn't be doing this, but I need your permission to bring in an electri electrician here to figure out what the heck is going on. And he's like, Mr. Ritz, do not put yourself through this. You just need to move on. This is done. And I'm like, really? <laughs> move on? Yeah. You lose a son and tell me just move no. on. No. So anyway, eventually he uh, said, fine. Put yourself through this. Go ahead. Now, I'd already called the electrician. <laughs> Make forgiveness, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> and so the electrician was in route, but he said, 
do not touch a thing until my deputies arrive. And then he got on the phone because it wasn't 30 minutes until the world descended upon this marina, as well as just media. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was crazy. And, um, <clears throat> but my electrician arrived first and uh, we came up with a game plan of how to go about testing this. And so um, basically what we did, and I'm gonna go back here, you know, we started at this end of the marina. We first measured, you know, that seven volts again. <clears throat> it's still there. Planted a man with a meter and a little bit more of an electrode than just my test lead in the water. And his job was to yell if there was any change whatsoever. Are you okay with all that so far? Yeah. So he, he stood there and did that job, and which is right around this area, and we systematically went to every single boat. We turned off the power and then unplugged the cord. Nothing, no change. And we did this all the way through the marina and all of these, and we came down to where the, the, the boat was, where this all occurred, and we turned off the breaker, and he yells. The voltage is gone. We turned back on the breaker. The voltage is back. We turned it back off again. The voltage is gone. Then we turned it back on and did our due diligence and moved all the way through the rest of the brain. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. And then we came back to this location. Now, when we got here, um, still had the seven volts here. I went and measured right here. And there was 30 volts AC right there. Measured right here, 70 volts AC right there. And right a foot off the back of that boat was 118 volts or so. So the two deputies that are there with us and PUD and you know all these other people, first of all, we like it's time to figure out what's going on. We've isolated down to these two boats. And the one deputy said, I am not getting on one of those boats. <laughs> Fine. Uh, you're going to be, you would be fine, but I understand. And, uh, but one of the deputies did join us. And we went to this boat first. And uh, we, the first thing we tested to see and check for, is there an AC safety ground? Okay, that's the green wire. You've probably all seen the green wire in your electrical system. Most important wire on the boat. I call it the holy grail by the way, right? So this vessel had an appropriate AC safety ground. And uh, so then long and short, we got on this boat. And the first thing, and, and I was very involved, maybe more involved than I should have been. But I went and the first thing with my bolt meter I brought, we brought a safety ground because we discovered that there was no safety ground on this boat. Now, there is one pedestal per slip here. And what the owner of this boat had done is he had this wired appropriately and under normal circumstances, but he wanted to get power to this boat while he was, because he moved onto this boat to finish repairing this vessel, and then he was gonna move off back onto here and rewire this one. That was his plan. And he brought the boat in five days earlier. So we discovered that there was no safety ground going from this boat to here. The wire was in there. The conductor was there, but it was broken. It was an extension cord. How would you know that the extension cord's safety ground had been broken? I mean, that's not something you're going to normally know, nor is it something you're going to test for. Unless you look at that cord, notice that the pin has been pulled out which many of you have probably seen that over the years, which, you know, what is that, $10,000 fine today, I think, from OSHA, you know, if you find that. This is an important wire, super important wire. So we get aboard, and we bring an AC safety ground, 
and I attach one side of my meter to safety ground, and I go to the 12 volt batteries to start with. 120 volt on the 12 volt batteries, AC. Everybody goes, well, why didn't you blow up? Because they don't blow up. They're fine, okay, with that. They blow up for other reasons, but not that. The port engine, 120 volts. The starboard engine, 120 volts. Even the galley, in the galley there, there was a, a towel rack, a stainless steel towel rack. And when it was installed, somebody shot a screw in there and it nicked NAC safety ground on the boat, okay? It had 120 volts on it. So if you even grab the hold of that towel rack, okay, the clutch and throttle. This was a Rhinel 27 twin engine boat. Everything's hot. Okay? Ken, the owner, and his girlfriend Mona had been on there for five days living on this boat with everything hot. This is an important point here. Coming up. Uh, so, five days earlier, when they brought the boat in, they started smelling something burning. So what did Ken do? He went to the battery switch and he turned it off. All right, you with me on that? So he turned off the DC system entirely and the smell went away. Oh, okay, I don't need this DC system. I'm gonna rip it out anyway. AC still working, <coughs> we're good to go. So now let's get back to how is it that Ken and Mona are on this boat for five days with everything being hot, when I say hot, energized to 120 volts, and they're just fine. Everybody in Andy, Andy can't answer this. It's going through the, back through the water, back to the ground? Well, let me tell you how, <laughs> you, know, we, you know, this is where we're kind of, the, the story is gonna continue, but I gotta start bringing in the technical side of things. It's important. And, and there's some standards um, that I learned about. I knew about ABYC standards before this happened, but uh, this really prompted me to get very serious about ABYC standards. So there's a standard in ABYC standards that says that the AC safety ground shall be connected to the engine negative terminal or its bus, okay? And what that means is that that green wire gets connected to your DC system. Now the green wire is just a safety ground. It's not supposed to be carrying current at any moment. You know, it is there in case of a fault. But it also is on the case of what? It touches everything. Especially when we tie that AC safety ground to the DC negative. Now, back to how you get electrocuted. If this was two separate tables here, and I touch this table, and I got another table right here, or maybe this, this projector here, and let's say that this is 120 volts, and this is at 120 volts, and I touch both those tables at the same time, what's gonna happen to me? Am I gonna know anything? I'm not even gonna know it. But if this is at 30, and that's at 120, I'm in real trouble. Does that make sense to everybody? So, if everything's at the same voltage, I can't get electrocuted. I am the bird on the wire. You know that phrase? Bird on the wire. Mm -hmm. So you look at a bird up there and it's at 47,000 volts or whatever they're running, 74,000 volts in some cases. Okay, they're just up there tweeting away and everything's fine because they're not grounded. They're not touching something that's differential. That is why that standard is in place there. It's super important. So one of the things I do when I get on a boat is like, I need to know that this exists. Are we good? Yeah. <laughs> that was not planned. <laughs> okay, so everything is hot on this boat, and um, whoo, yes, yeah, so the, the question of whether or not AC was involved is now resolved. And um, let's, you know, when I'm, I'm, I'm on this boat and stuff, and you'll be a little amazed, and I'm really hoping that your vessels don't look like this. But this was what we were greeted with 
when we got on this boat. Okay, now, uh, I'm not picking on anybody, but uh, there's a lot of boats out there that don't look that much different than this. And the wiring that you're looking at there wasn't the wiring that was, um, so to speak, responsible, right? But um, we're getting to that. But this just gives you an idea of the general <coughs> condition of this vessel. Are wire nuts okay on boats? Okay, anybody know why they're not okay? Vibration. Vibration. They're designed for solid conductor wire. They're designed for Romex. Okay, and we're not allowed. So, solid conductor wire, you know, like you have in your house, it's just one nice big strand of copper wire. We're supposed to have stranded copper wire on our boats, right? And we're supposed to use ring terminals and crimped on fittings and no soldering and all these things. Uh, these are trailer connected. All these things are not allowed for very, very good reasons. Okay, so um, as we're moving through here, uh, I find this wire here. You see this wire? What can you say about this wire as you look at it? Scary. Scary. Can we say that its thermal limit has been exceeded? <laughs> okay, we're on the same page. How does that happen? Too much current. Hmm, so let me ask you another question. Should there not be an overcurrent protection device? Mm. Now that's what I call them, but that would be a breaker or a fuse. That's just the general technical term, an overcurrent protection device. Fuse or breaker. Did you know that there's supposed to be an overcurrent protection device on every single circuit on a boat? Mm -hmm. With one exception? Bilge what is it everybody but Andy? Bilge pump. <laughs> no? Bilge pump's required? Yeah. Yeah. Engine start circuit. And that is there because we don't, the Coast Guard is the one that's mandating this, they don't want you to be in a situation where you need to emergently start your vessel and pop a breaker or fuse, overcurrent protection device, not be able to start that in. I, I picture the Columbia River bar, yeah. right? So I'm out there fishing, you know, and I'm doing my thing, and all of a sudden the tide changes, and I need to start this engine, and I pop a fuse, next thing I'm on the south jet. That's not good. Okay, so can we all agree that there was no overcurrent protection device on here? Um, I guess we could say, or it wasn't properly sized, but I will tell you there was no overcurrent protection device here. Okay, so its thermal limit was exceeding. Now, unfortunately, this purple wire came from the instrument package at the helm station. You know, oil pressure, temperature, RPMs, all of those things times two, because this is a twin engine, all right? And typically, there's a small fuse that feeds the power to all of those gauges, because those gauges work by sending small amount of DC uh, voltage and current to whatever the device is. Let's say it is a temperature gauge, all right? So it's gonna send a small amount of DC plus, and at the end of that thing, is a sensor, a thermocouple. And that is going to basically, as it gets hot, it's gonna work in reverse of what one might think, but it's gonna allow more current through so the gauge goes up. Okay, and this is how these things work. It's grounded to the block of the engine. Okay, so this device here, uh, in this case, was a temperature gauge, and um, there was no overcurrent protection, and we don't know why the fault occurred. Today I would have figured out why, but it didn't matter to us at the time. This is what mattered to us, and me, and the electrician, and the sheriff deputy that would get on the boat, they're the ones standing out there nervously. Um, but here we go. That same purple wire, can you see it right here? Well, there is this floating AC box. Is that okay? No, no, it has to be secured. In fact, I got a DC wire here, and I got AC wire here touching it. Is that okay, <laughs> per standard? No. It's supposed to be in sheeting. There should be some form of separation here, okay? It's okay to run them together, but there has to be something in, in between. And I, I swear, 
This picture right here, there are five standards that I feel if just one of those standards had been implemented, this wouldn't have happened. Just one, okay? So, these, things, these standards are important, and that's why I decided to go down the road of ABYC and got my certification, and they asked me to start teaching, and then the next thing I knew, I was teaching for them full time and, and uh, worked for them for many years. I believe in the standards, all right? They're good, solid standards. They're minimum standards. Okay, well, here we go. So this connection point here was incredibly small. Okay, in fact, you can see, can you see this purple wire, how it's still burnt there? Can you see kind of the shiny stuff right in here? This had been happening uh, for a little bit, but uh, that five days earlier, it finally melted enough that it made contact and went through to this AC mm. hot wire. The hot wire, right? What we call the ungrounded, the one that's above ground in terms of voltage. Now, under normal circumstances, if this vessel had an appropriate AC safety ground, what would have happened when this occurred? Instantly, we would have tripped a circuit breaker. There's one at the pedestal, there's one on the, on the main, the 30 amp breaker there, it would have popped just like that. And, and that would have been the end of the story. They wouldn't have AC, um, but, you know, Lucas would still be here. Um, the other thing that didn't happen, it didn't catch the boat on fire. And I remember thinking, I kind of wish it caught the boat on fire, if you can understand that, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Um, so it sat there for five days just waiting, uh, not literally that it's waiting, you know, it's not an animate pro uh, thing, but it was just sitting there waiting for something to come along. And uh, Lucas came along and uh, unfortunately uh, was electrocuted. In fact, Lucas was the first case, documented case, of someone being electrocuted in the water while touching what? Water. Nothing. Just water. So how does that happen? Delta v. I'm sorry? Delta V. Delta V. I'm going to call it voltage gradient. So I'm going to back up just a couple okay. things here because we need to under, I'd like you to understand this. Is it not, is, it, is that work for anybody when I say voltage gradients? Okay, in this particular case, this is fresh water, very, very fresh water. And fresh water doesn't have a lot of ions in it. And I'm not going to go very far down that road. I'm just going to say it's highly resistive. In other words, electricity doesn't transfer through it very well. Okay, and so what it does is because of that, as we get further from the source, these voltage, I call them gradients, are going to diminish. They're going to go down. Okay? What did I just tell you about how you get electrocuted? I got to be touching two, at least two different voltage gradients. Does that make sense to you? And if I'm bridging these voltage gradients, then I'm going to have current running through my body. Now, what if there's a lot of voltage and very fresh water, then I could be bridging many of these gradients, and that's what happened to Lucas. And the reason his color was so perfect while I'm doing CPR is because it stopped his heart instantly. Okay? So um, his heart was completely stopped. There was no water in his lungs whatsoever. I had to talk with the coroner and Anyway, we don't need to go down that road, but uh, um, let's just say that he finally, you know, he goes, what his, I guess I should tell you this, because he goes, well, I asked him if he made a decision about what happened, and he goes, yes, death by drowning. And I said, really? How can that be when his face was never in the water? And, and I said, was there any water in his lungs? No. So how did he drown? Oh, he tried from died from dry drowning. Okay? Uh, and Cheryl's sitting right there and shaking her head. This is not a thing. And uh, he said, well, your son was probably so scared that his throat just closed up. How, how, excuse me? Anyway, I had to hang up on this man. 
And uh, I've been invited to, he's, um, I've been invited a couple times to speak to the coroners, except I can't talk about Lucas's case because he's still embarrassed about this, I think. I don't know why, but I just say, no, I will talk about Lucas. And they go, well, we can't have you come here. Because he's now the chief coroner, or was, for the state of Oregon. Uh, anyway, moving forward. Oh, yeah. Here it is. As you can see, he finally came along and said, electrocuted in water while swimming. First documented case.